Now, when our next guest turned 47, he came across some research that said people around that age are at their unhappy happiest in life. So that spurred him on to delve deeper into the research of happiness and what he can do to have a happier life. So, Professor of Psychiatry at Trinity College in Dublin, Brendan Kelly is joining us this morning to discuss his new book, which is called The Science of Happiness. Good morning, Brendan. Hi, Brendan. Thank you very much for having me. We are all seeking the answers and enlightenment. So when you read this research that 47 had been determined as the, as, as the peak age of unhappiness, did that align with your own experience? Well, it interested me hugely because I was 47. I am 47 on the button at the minute. And the research says we start life relatively happy. We get more unhappy as it goes on. In the 30s, we're getting pretty unhappy. And the lowest point is the mid to late 40s. But if we survive in good health into our 60s, 70s and 80s, chances are things will brighten up a lot. And why 47? Why is that the most miserable point in our lives? I mean, it should be a point where, you know, you've climbed the corporate ladder or you've done the work bit and you've achieved whatever you need to achieve or some of it maybe. Yeah. You possibly have a family. You know, why would it be an unhappy time? Have we not achieved enough maybe? I think for all the reasons you've given, that's why it's the unhappy time. <laughs> because you've achieved you know something at work perhaps you're working hard you're either getting promoted or not getting promoted okay both of which are stressful yeah and with family you know there are often your children who bring great happiness just to be very clear about that <laughs> but also a certain sense of um you know responsibility and you need to look out for them and maybe aging relatives as well there are also mortgages or increasingly uh, people who are still renting and trying to get a mortgage so there's a lot going on um, and it's a time of very great burdens but there are better times ahead. OK, and is this universal? I mean, is 47, does it apply to everyone or does only some people experience this? Well, it's an average uh, figure, so a lot of people will differ. But what's really interesting is in over 150 countries in the world where this has been studied, the same finding. There's this U shape in happiness where we start out happy, toward the middle, we're pretty glum, and toward the you know, later decades, we're happier because we look back on the competition and the work and comparing ourselves with other people, and we realise none of it ever mattered. OK, but we won't learn that until we get there. It takes a while to experience that, yeah. What about men and women? Are we both the same in terms of the age that we are, happy or unhappy? Yeah, we follow the same curve. Really? But traditionally, women rated themselves as happier than men. The past two decades have seen that change dramatically, and men and women now rate themselves equally happy, despite the many changes that happen for women, you know, more participation in the workplace, more education. All of that progression. So but yeah. it hasn't impacted on that curve? Not, not hugely. The progression hasn't been nearly enough. Yes. But there has been progression. But the main beneficiaries in terms of happiness appear to be men. Uh, because women, it seems, have held on to all their old responsibilities in the home and with children, as well as working outside the home. So you've got this double jobbing going on. And uh, men are the winners there. OK, um, you do have some tips for happiness and we hope there's some magic in that for us all in a moment. But we just saw there briefly on screen some of the other findings you found through the course of your research. Um, having a baby increases happiness for two years. Yes, there's a bump in happiness uh, just before a baby is born and for almost two years afterwards. But after that, happiness goes back to how it was prior to the birth. This is true for the first two babies. With the third baby, the bump in happiness is less. And with the fourth one, it's not even detectable. So, um... <laughs> Well, uh, apologies to any of the third, fourth or fifth children that came along in their families this morning. You, you, were, did you I, were inconsequential. Did you happy? Well, I should point out, this is at the time of the birth around then. Children do make people happy in other ways, particularly uh, in later life. You find parents are happier than non-parents uh, in later life. And this is particularly the case after the children leave home. And of course, it would have a knock-on effect on various other family members, grandparents, etc. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are wider ripples in these, in these yes. research findings. They interact and need to be taken sort of, you know, with, with, with some care. It's also different country to country. Ireland is one of the few countries where non-parents are happier than parents. Um, and that's in contrast to places like Portugal, for example, where parents are a lot happier than non-parents. The happiest okay. country is Finland, is that right? Yes, the Nordic countries, always top of the list. Mm. Uh, in a list of around 150 countries, they're all at the top. At the bottom, you have countries like Afghanistan and Ireland. We come in around 15th out of 150. Really? Yeah. OK, yeah, we often see the Nordic countries top those various yeah. quality yeah. of life surveys yeah. that they do annually. OK, make us happy. Tips for happiness. How can we be happier? 
Okay, so you, you, you get happy by living in the moment as much as you conceivably can. And you create good circumstances for that by sleeping well. That's my number one uh, piece of advice. We don't sleep as much as we should or as well as we should. We need to uh, dream more, think about our dreams at night time, try to daydream during the day as much as possible as well um, when it's safe to do so. We need to watch our diets, do some exercise, around 150 minutes of vigorous exercise a week. We need to watch our activities, not get ourselves overscheduled or underscheduled. And we need to try and maintain a sense of balance through all of this, which can be difficult mm. get, given, all, given all the advice I've just, I've just announced. In terms of uh, living through COVID, Brendan, do you think we are happier or will be happier when we, when we come through this in terms of appreciating the things that are free, the simple things, the kind of back to basic things, rather than chasing all of the material things that we might have been doing pre-COVID? Well, COVID has certainly been an extraordinary wake-up call about our values and the things that matter when so many of them were suddenly taken from us. Yeah. We know from the research around one person in five in the population is struggling to a very significant extent over and above what they could usually cope with with their usual coping mechanisms like their families and friends and going running and all of that. Mm -hmm. I think it will shift our value system. We will learn to appreciate other things. Um, one of the extraordinary um, uh, boosts at the moment is the vaccination program and I think you referred to it earlier your yeah. viewers were sending in messages and uh, so having been vaccinated some time ago I can certainly say the psychological boost of vaccination the optimism uh, the shot of optimism is absolutely extraordinary is this yes okay that's great so it, it gives you that sense that liberation is coming yeah. almost on a personal level and then collectively as well yeah. um, now you have principles as well uh, broad, broadly, maybe we could talk about some of them, six that you've discovered in your research and that are in your book. That's right. So we start first with, uh, uh, I suppose, the principle of balance, which I talk a lot about Taoism in the book. And balance is about being in harmony with things around you, in harmony with nature and the patterns of life. Also, acceptance is important. Um, acceptance is accepting the things that we can change, cannot change and changing the things that we can, very much like the serenity prayer that many people will be familiar with from other contexts. I talk about love as one of the principles, and this starts with self-compassion. Now, the idea of love has been hijacked basically by romantic love. But I talk a lot about self-compassion and self-acceptance and also loving your broader networks and valuing the people in those networks and the planet and, and so forth. Another and, good point you make, Brendan, is avoiding comparisons. Easier said than done in a world of social media where everyone's life looks better than yours. Yeah, I mean, social media has allowed us to compare ourselves with other people in a way that we never could. We can do more of it, we can do it faster, and we can compare ourselves. We can make the most ridiculous comparisons, mm. you know. Even if we dismiss them in our heads, we know that comparing ourselves to movie stars or social media celebrities mm. is a bit daft, but we still do it, and it has an, packs an emotional punch. So the message I have is to be aware of this and simply try and do less of it. Okay. Obviously, keeping a distance between you and your phone as much as possible is, is very helpful. Okay, yeah. very interesting. Finally, Brennan, is, is happiness a choice? We can make choices to create a sort of a life conducive to happiness. Um, it's difficult to choose to be happy, but we can choose to sort of put into place the circumstances that will help make us and other people happier. And happiness is infectious. If you are happy, people around you will get happier too. So we do have a responsibility, if you like, to try and be a positive element in our social networks and our families. And that's what the book is about, helping us to increase those happiness skills, if you like. Yeah, but you've come in here, Brendan, and you're saying that you were at your most unhappy at 47, but yet you've brought a calm and a cheeriness and, you know, a sense of fun. So you seem perfectly happy now. Are you happier since the book <laughs> and maybe the vaccination as well? I'm happier since the book. The research told me I should be at my unhappy, unhappiest at 47, but I'm actually pretty chipper uh, and always <laughs> have been. And there are people who have kind of a happy set point yeah. and people who are a little more pessimistic but even for those people there's a lot of a lot that can be done to try and be happier okay well we hope you stay happy and chipper thanks so much for being with us this morning